Bill, take it away. And Thanks today's Bill's birthday. Jim. Today's my birthday. Today's Bill's birthday. Thank you. And I'm, I'm 73. I thought most of you all would be 73, but that's, there are a lot of younger people here. Everybody looks younger. So, um, uh, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, a geriatric psychiatrist, so I spend most of my uh, working day talking to older people. So what I'm going to try to present for you is uh, what are the things that, that we know and what can you do. Uh, and the other thing is I'm going to encourage you to take the long view of your life. That is to say, what's going to happen in the future. Now, the, this is Social Security data. By the way, Jay was an excellent basketball player. I thought he was terrific. Had he gone to a different school, he could have been a star. If he played at Yale, it would have been great. You know? so, um, so this is Social Security. Uh, so you've got uh, 12, men have about 12.43 years. Women, slightly more. That's your life expectancy if you're already 73. Now, uh, go back to the year 1900, life expectancy was 47 years. But the, but the major advance that medicine's made in the last 100 years is we've eliminated infectious diseases. And so the things that are going to get you are going to be chronic illnesses. So what I'm going to try to give you is present the, the, the data of why you, the things that you can do will help you make it to your 60th college reunion. And I hope you'll invite me back if we're here. So number one, heart disease. Two, cancer. Three, stroke. Four, Alzheimer's disease. People didn't used to record Alzheimer's disease as an illness. That's the most frightening one, and Jeanette's going to talk to you some more about that. Lung disease, pneumonia, and influenza. We used to call that the old man's friend because it was the painless exit from life when you're 92 years old and you're not doing well and you say sayonara. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> renal disease and finally falls that I will talk a lot about. Now what happens with falls? Women fall and break their hips. And that is a bad thing because most people who break their hips, most women, will more than half, will not return to normal walking again. Men fall and hit their heads. They're too slow to catch themselves. Uh, hit their heads. and uh, So, can your future be modified? I'm going to try to argue yes it can uh, because lifestyle, your lifestyle and risk factors have more to do with how long you're going to live than the number with your age. That is to say, what you're doing now and how active you are says more about how long you're going to live and more the, about how your parents, more than your parents age when they died. Strength, uh, flexibility and stamina drops after age 55 and you, you lose 1% of your, of, your, of your muscle mass and 1% of your bone mass every year. Now it doesn't sound like much until you start thinking of it by decades. So every 10 years you lose 10% of your bone mass, 10% of your muscle mass. So what you've got to do is you've got to recoup, you've got to recover, you've got to do something to help fight that attrition. 62% of women in the age of 75 and 85 to 85 have trouble kneeling or stooping, and 66% can't lift 10 pounds. Pitiful. 42% uh, can't stand, and uh, the MacArthur study found that substantial number of these people could really improve your level of function. Fitness present, uh, pr uh, really predicts longevity. I'm gonna, by the way, what I'm going to tell you today is not really my opinion so much. I've really tried to gather evidence as much as I can. This is not just uh, sort of uh, my Bill Petrie's idea. So things you already know. You already know this. Don't smoke. There, there are not a lot of smokers here, by the way, for your 50th reunion. Maybe one or two. Most of them have died because that's going <laughs> to... That knocks 10% that knocks off. It knocks 10% off, I mean 10 years already if you're smoking. Terrible. And if you don't die of lung cancer, you're going to definitely have cardiovascular disease and other factors uh, going on. Healthy weight, and particularly a consistent weight. If you weigh about the same in the study of 100-year-old New Englanders, the people who weighed the same throughout their lives, they did better. 30 minutes of daily vigorous activity every day. 
and you know that. And I'm going to talk a lot more of that uh, ad nauseum. And a healthy diet, and we'll talk about that. Moderate alcohol intake. I, I'm sorry to, to bring this to you today. <laughs> maybe, maybe I can, you know, I can give you a reprieve from that. But at any rate, uh, alcoholism and alcohol abuse are problems long term. And what happens as you get older is you get written, alcoholics get written off. So it's like, oh, that's Uncle Alfred. Forget, we're not going to go down to the jail anymore. Or we're not going to go to the emergency room. We've been doing it for 40 years. We're not going to do it anymore. Okay, things you might not know. Things you might not know. TV can kill you. What do I mean by that? And that means more than four hours of television a day. And a lot of Americans increases cardiovascular mortality. It increases type 2 diabetes. It increases all-cause mortality. Look it up. It's crazy. What is it? I had a, a patient of mine who was an internist who was diabetic. And he said, when I watch a lot of TV, I have to take more insulin. It's an intermediate state between resting uh, and, uh, and sleep and activity that's not healthy. So TV, not a good idea, and it's not good for your brain. Uh, beware of more than 14 drinks a week. For women, it's probably more than 10, and that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good number. The fact is, alcohol is a mixed bag. There are a lot of good things that alcohol does, and there are a lot of bad things that it does. Uh, the good things are that uh, it actually improves some cardiovascular factors, and it has some effect uh, early on of reducing the incidence of dementia. Reducing the incidence of dementia if you drank throughout, because of the structure of the, the alcohol molecule and how it works. So it's a mixed bag. Obviously, there are many other problems. If we tried to approve it now through the FDA, we probably said, no, we, we don't want that. Drink more coffee. Drink more coffee. Less alcohol, more coffee. Coffee, and it's about three and a half cups a day. There are some recent studies that show that it quickens your thinking, and you, you're a little bit more active. And the more you, your brain is working, the better it's going to do. And coffee is one thing that can do that on a regular basis. It has a positive effect on Parkinson's disease slightly. Uh, marriage improves survival for men more than women. So the bottom line, <laughs> that's not news, the bottom line is everybody needs a wife. <laughs> so, uh, uh, by the way, if you look at gay couples, I mean male gay couples and lesbian couples, guess who are the more unhappy? It's the lesbian. They're, they're dissatisfied with the relationship. More than gay men. Interesting. Okay, forget that. Loneliness is dangerous. Lo loneliness is bad for your health. It's really bad for you. And uh, if you aren't happy, fake it. You'll get more friends. Uh, and and uh, if, you have, if you live alone, have a dog. Because dogs foster attachment. And attachment is healthy. So I'll, and I'll come back to this later. Attachment is healthy. Dogs reduce cardiovascular uh, events and attacks, and there was a stu study just last week about that. Better for men than for women. Men, know, men do things to dogs they would never do to their spouses. You know, oh, how are you doing? <laughs> they hug them, they touch them. Oh, come here, boy. You know, women, uh, hey, how are you doing? So, okay. What, what are the uh, advantages of fitness and exercise? Well, first of all, the World Health Organization says you'll live longer. You'll sleep better because you've exerted throughout the day. You'll maintain your driving skills better, and that's a huge thing. When you get to be 85, you want to drive. Because if you can't drive at 85, it's like being under house arrest. Can't leave, can't go anywhere, whatever. Learn your serial sevens, because that, that's going to be on the uh, driving test. 93, you've got to keep going. Learn those serial sevens. That's what they'll, that's what they'll ask you. <laughs> Fitness, yes. Yeah, you want to drive, and you drive slowly when you do it. Okay, reduces falls. Fitness reduces falls. That's huge, huge, because you've got to put muscles around your bones. Improves bone density, extends your social horizons. If you're in good shape, you can walk up the bleachers of your grandchildren's soccer game and you can walk and go places you might not be able to go improves cardiovascular health and improves cognition 
improves cognition. Um, so what must you do? Well, you must have fitness. You, and we'll, we'll, you must have cognitive challenge, and I'll talk about that. Watching the Discovery Channel is not <laughs> cognitive challenge. Okay? Um, social engagement, healthy diet, sleep, managing adversity. So when you get sick, what are you going to do? That's a big one. That's a biggie. And the bottom line is, you can be sick, just don't feel ill. You've got to, because everybody's going to get sick. You're going to have problems. You probably already have problems. I have problems. You cannot let it direct your life. And finally, to try to come up with purpose and meaning in your life. And we'll talk about that. And that's sometimes tough after retirement. Uh, so fitness helps the brain. What does it do? First, it generates a compound called nerve growth factor. So if you're active physically, you are making, you're activating neurons, and you're making a few, the few neurons that you can still make at age 73. <laughs> there are not many areas you can do it, but you can in certain areas, the hippocampus, for one. Uh, osteocalcin, this is another compound that is, uh, that is increased with fitness, and particularly with long bone activity. Long bone stimulation generates osteocalcin, and that helps memory. So that's why I'm going to tell you, you got to walk as the perfect exercise because you're going to get your long bones active and busy and producing this. It increases blood flow, of course. It reduces, we know it reduces forgetfulness. Uh, it uh, delays the onset of dementia, fitness. So if you're going to get demented, and you know, sadly, you know, you get to the high numbers, 85, 90, 95, it's pretty scary. But you can delay that if you are more fit. And people who have increased fitness have a lower incidence and a later onset. Improves depression, which is important, and improves white matter disease. These are two people walking outside. They're, and outside is big. Outside is valuable because we think that there are inflammatory factors that are reduced when people are outdoors. And it took a long time to figure this one out. Um, uh, that being outside is good, and being outside with friends is good. You may have read something recently about tennis, people who live longer if they play tennis, and that's because it's a social sport, they tend to be outside. So I'm telling you right now, walk a mile every day. And I'm going to tell you this in 10 years, if you invite me back, still walk a mile every day. The older you get, the more the value of fitness has, the more the impact it has on health. Walking speed predicts uh, your life expectancy, how fast you walk. How fast you walk predicts how long you will live. Uh, strong quadriceps, these muscles in your thigh, those are the big ones, and those are the ones that prevent you from falling. Those are the ones you got to work on. Uh, walk with others, walk outside, as I've said. Reduce contag it reduces contagious diseases because you're outside more. People get cold, get more illnesses in the winter because they're, they're in internal inside systems that recirculate. It improves pulmonary function and it reduces arthritic pain. Worst thing an arthritic you can do for, with serious arth, uh, arthritis is to lie down. You lie down. Don't lie down. Don't lie down. Don't even, don't nap much. Who said this? Yes, Thoreau said it. Now, now he's talking about philosophy. I mean, he's talking about the soul. Um, it also is good for your body because of this anti-inflammatory effect. They did a study of people living in uh, San Francisco. Half of them, they walked through the city. The other half, they walked out in the woods by uh, Stanford. And the ones that walked in the woods had lower inflammatory factors. Okay, what do I mean by, col by uh, cognitive challenge? Well, it turns out brains... Your brain loves going to college. It's the best thing you can do for your brain and the best thing you did for your brain. And that's why people who develop dementia, that's one of the things we say. College and education lowers your risk for dementia. Now, how can that be? Because when you go to college, your brain changes. You start growing spicules. Your neurons change. And you want to do that throughout your life. You want to extend your comfort range. Do things that, when I say challenge, do something that's difficult, that's effortful. Take courses. There's a, a company used to uh, 
used to be called Elder Hostel, now called Road, Road Scholars, where you go all over the country or all over the world to take courses. Osher, Vanderbilt has an Osher Lifelong Learning Institute here that's really good and very helpful. All universities, almost all universities have these offerings for seniors. Be creative, you've got the time now to do it. Artwork, music, could be gardening. Uh, it could be a host of uh, things that you can do to be creative. Uh, limit TV, take music lessons. Now music lessons are an example, a piano lesson is an example of a cognitive challenge. You come every week, you got to play, you're learning, it's a motor skill, it's a cognitive skill. That's the model of what you need to do. Um, okay, improve computer skills because that's how you're going to keep up with your uh, family. Read poetry and, 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 don't use this for directions. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Why? I'll tell you why. You can do it for traffic patterns, but orientation is a basic human trait. Or how do you find one thing? And what do you do when this turns on? Turn right. Now turn left. Turn right. Turn right. All you're doing is listening. You don't say, now, God, where is Chestnut? Did, where is this end? What street is that on? Gosh, i got to figure out stuff. That's active problem solving. And your brain will cut loose of functions that you don't use. If you're not doing math, if you're not doing spatial, and this orientation is basic for human survival. I mean, it, and that's a basic skill you don't want to lose. Okay. Uh, social engagement. Replace friends lost through death and retirement. You've got to replace friends. Let me say that again. Replace friends. Because uh, talk, but mostly talk some, but mostly listen. Be a listener in your old age. Be a listener. Social sports, like tennis, tai chi, and yoga. Uh, make friends with people that are not like you. Don't go to the country club and see everybody that's just like you, and so on. Meet new people. Go to new places. Uh, read to your grandchildren. You could read to your children, too, but read to your grandchildren. <laughs> Walk together. Sing, dance, and volunteer. Okay. Mind diet. What about eating? What should we eat? Okay. The mind diet. It's a combination of a, something called a DASH diet, which was designed for hypertension. Uh, it was dietary advances to stop hypertension, kidney disease, and also memory. Uh, it improves cognitive function and improves vascular health. So it combines the Mediterranean diet, good, and the DASH diet. And this has proven to improve cognitive function. Basically, it's a plant diet. Uh, it's a lot of plants. You, can, you have proteins, but you don't have that kind of protein that much. I don't want to spoil your dinner tonight, but red meat is not all that great for you. Uh, and uh, there, there are a lot of reasons for it. So what I'm going to, I've got an alternative for you. Uh, twice, twice a week, eat sardines. Loaded with omega-3 free fatty acids. Loaded with them. Healthy. Number two, it's a wild fish. And before long, we're not going to have many more wild, many more wild fish. It's a wild fish, and it's not a predator fish, so it's lower in mercury. i got to hurry. Red meat, bad, the five bad foods you, you, you shouldn't be eating too much of, okay? Try to substitute a fish meal for a red meat meal. And this is, by the way, the American diet. Okay, uh, closest relationships contribute a lot to lifespan. N marital dysfaction has been associated with sudden, uh, su sudden cardiac death. That's no mystery to you all. You've seen that. People are miserable. They come home. You know, and, and they don't do well. Well, we're now, we got the data to, to back that up. Uh, you know less than you think you do about your intimates. And finally, telling your partner about your organs or your bowels is not intimacy. That is not intimacy. Nobody wants to hear that. Tell your doctor. Doc, oh, I got this. Ah, oh, I got it. Okay. Where are we going? I'm in a hurry to go. What do we want to do in the next 10 years psychologically? People used to think that psychological development stopped at 20. That's what I learned. You don't. What, you, what we want to move is self-absorption to empathy. That is to not so much focus on ourselves, narcissistic preoccupation, 
but empathy, other people, not just your grandchildren, but grandchildren everywhere. Bitterness and resentment to gratitude and acceptance. Let me say again, hostility and bitterness associated with increased cardi cardiac mor mortality. So the take home lesson is, don't be an asshole. <laughs> It's bad for your health. It's bad for your health. So, uh, and finally, management of the end game. Okay. Uh, and f let me just say this. This is George Valen. Wonderful book on triumphs of experience. Uh, the most important con uh, contributor to joy and success in adult life is love or attachment. Love or attachment. So it's really important. And finally, let me say one thing. These two 90-year-old women I mean, I'm sorry, a nine-year-old couple came to the, see the judge in divorce court. Uh, they'd been married 68 years, went to see the judge and said, oh, yeah, we're unhappy, we want a divorce. And uh, the judge looked at him and said, yeah, but why did you wait so long? He said, well, we were waiting for the children to die. <laughs> Thank you. Don't follow a dog act. Bill, that was a okay. slam dunk, even though you dropped out of the basketball team. <laughs> and I just want to say, while we're getting ready here, that I am so impressed that so many of you have come to a Saturday morning class after a big Friday night party. I'm going to teach this on to you. We are, we are still but, in the game. Mm -hmm. and then you can put that on to yourself. I, I don't know you that well. <laughs> you would have eagerly gotten up and been anxious to get to class on time to hear what she had to teach you. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Jeanette, or Dr. Norton, is a neuroscientist and has done, uh, conducted research in nerve regeneration for 20 years. She's also a professor emerita of the Vanderbilt Medical School, where she started teaching in 1981 and taught medical students, graduate students, and undergraduate students, and acted as the director of medical education in the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology. That is a mouthful. <laughs> Until her retirement in 2013. As a teacher, her emphasis was on the personal development of her students. And her innovative approach to integrating humanity into a basic science course. Those traits were recognized both at Vanderbilt, nationally, and internationally. As a teacher at Vanderbilt, she won every award given by medical students for excellence in teaching. And not just once, but multiple times. She also speaks in outreach programs in schools and in the public on psychoactive drugs. We don't really know that. That was after us. <laughs> uh, Alzheimer's and other topics in neuroscience. She's also a real popular course leader in the Ollie Lifelong Learning Center at Vanderbilt, which is where I met her in 2014 when I took her six weeks course on the neuroscience of learning and behavior. Now, when I was at Vanderbilt, um, I avoided meticulously any course that had anything to do with science other than the one we had to take in our freshman year. So I had some trepidation about signing up for the neuroscience of learning and behavior. But I am so glad I did. Because when I did, it was transform transformational for me in helping me see that my brain really is in charge of every part of my life. And that I have the ability to help keep that brain healthy. So um, we don't have 18 hours, I don't think, maybe 18 minutes to cover what we studied in that. But you can see that even in a short presentation, there can be a big impact, like Dr. Petrie gave for us. And so, and a reminder, at the end of the presentation, you can ask your own questions that might come to mind during her presentation or his. Um, and if you still have questions about the brain after you've had these two sessions, when you get home, you can go register for the 36 lecture DVD on understanding the brain, which Dr. Norton created for the great courses. 
So without further ado, uh, it's my honor and my privilege to introduce Dr. Jeanette Norton and her assistant, Fred. <laughs> All I need is this. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I agree with everything Bill said, and I really don't have a lot to add, except what I'd like to do is to take you on a journey about a specific part of what he talked about. And that is something I think that we all fear as we get older, and that is a terrible disease called Alzheimer's disease. And as I give talks to the public, I see that a lot of people are worried about this, in themselves and in their loved ones. So you might think this isn't going to be a happy talk, but I hope by the end of it you'll see things that you can do that can decrease your risk for this terrible disease. So Alzheimer's disease is one type of dementia. It's not the only type of dementia. In fact, there are many different dementias, but one type of dementia. The word dementia simply means a decline in mental capacity or ability. So as, as the disease progresses, people become mentally impaired. Alzheimer's is only one dementia, but it's the most common type of dementia. And that's why when our loved ones are diagnosed with it, we always think, oh, they must have Alzheimer's. Well, they might have some other type. And physicians like Dr. Petrie are the individuals who decide what type of dementia and help you uh, from that point. Some cases of Alzheimer's are in fact familial, which means they're transmitted in families. Now, the good news of that is that it's only about 5% or a little more than 5% of the cases. That means more than 90% are not transmitted in families, and that's really important to understand. Very few people, in fact, have a genetic form of this disease, and we should be grateful for that. Now, Alzheimer's disease is also referred to as a neurodegenerative disease. So there are a number of neurodegenerative diseases, the three big ones being Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. These are the big neurodegenerative diseases. Alzheimer's is neurodegenerative, and what that means is nerve cells in the brain die. That's why it's called a neurodegenerative disease. In the other neurodegenerative diseases, different areas of the brain are going to die, but the nerve cells themselves die. Where neurons are lost is what's critical for understanding any neurodegenerative disease. So in Alzheimer's disease, you have the loss of very specific neurons in the brain that lead to the signs and symptoms you see in a patient. So I know this is maybe a little bit low, but I'll try by my words to communicate with people in the back of the audience. But those who can see Fred, he's a great little model. He's been used and abused by many medical students. So I will try to make sure that my words communicate what I want to say. You can lose neurons in specific areas of the brain. If you look at this brain model, it has only one large area here, which we call a hemisphere. So normally the brain has two hemispheres, okay? And these hemispheres, yes? Well, you know, that's a great idea. I'll put Fred up here, and we'll see if we can get, how's that? Is that a little bit better? I can't get him any higher than this, okay? I can carry so, you through the <laughs> So normally we have two hemispheres, and these hemispheres are these large areas that we look at, sit atop what we call the brain stem. So the hemispheres fit over the brain stem. And the reason this model, as I turn it like this or turn it like this, and even the brain stem as well, have all these different colors is because every one of those areas has a very specific function. And those functions, the neurons, those nerve cells in those areas, are connected to others into networks that underlie every single thing you do. Every thought you have, every memory you have, every ability to recognize your loved ones, every single thing you see, hear, 
and can do is a function of your brain. And so this is brought about by specific areas being connected to one another in a way that allows these functions to take place. If we just looked at the brain stem down here, okay, lots of different colors, but the brain stem is a really old part of the brain. And a lot of what it does is control things like heart rate, breathing, like I said, everything is controlled by the brain. So the brain stem controls things like that. Alzheimer's disease involves very few neurons down in this area. Alzheimer's disease primarily affects the neurons or nerve cells that are located in the outermost part of the hemisphere. And this outermost part of the hemisphere is called the cortex. And the word cortex means bark or rind. So it's the outer layer of nerve cells. Like if you looked at a brain, all the little wrinkles, that would be the cortex that you would be looking at. And these areas that are here control all of the higher order things that we associate with being human. So let me give you an idea what I mean by that. Here, where I put my finger, um, deep in the cortex in this area is an area called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a critical area involved in learning and memory. So this is one of the first areas that is lost in Alzheimer's disease. And it's why individuals keep asking the same questions over and over again, because they have no short-term memory. Okay? If you looked at another area, which is right about here, and I'm putting my finger on this, there's many more areas than even these colors represent. In this area is an area where when you look at a person, when you look at a person, you see a person, and that's a result of your cortex, but your ability to know who that person is is dependent on this area. This area allows you to put an identity with a person. If you were to lose those neurons, then you wouldn't be able to recognize your friends or your family, your children. Okay? You see where this is going, don't you? Okay. Let's think about, there's a lot of areas in here. There's a couple of hundred individual areas that allow you to understand what it is you're hearing or seeing or feeling. So we don't just see, we interpret what we see. If you were to lose neurons there, then you have trouble interpreting the world. There's all this sensory information, but you can't make sense out of it. So you might do something like, you remember that a fork is used for eating and that what's in your coffee cup you want to drink. You might have this loose thread, but you might use your fork to try to get the coffee to your mouth and not understand why it's falling out. You can't integrate information anymore. Then here in the front of the brain, right behind the forehead, critical areas that allow you to make judgments so you're presented with different alternatives for various things you try to make the best judgment you can it helps you inhibit impulse as we age we try to inhibit our impulses so we don't throw tantrums on the floor like a four-year-old and another thing this area of the brain is involved in is being able to allow you to have what's called working memory and working memory means the ability to follow a lecture like this or the ability to follow a TV show or to read a book and be able to understand the thread of the story. Normi normal people can read something one night, pick the book up the next day and pick up where they were at because they have working memory that allows this narrative to continue. Okay? Now, on this side, which we call the medial side of the brain, okay, we have discovered that there are multiple areas on this medial surface of the brain that are involved in something else. This is called the default mode network. And part of what this does is allow us, when we're not taking in information from the external world, is to have a sense of who we are 
an internal dialogue that gives us a sense of self. And this, combined with a working hippocampus, okay, allows us to create an autobiography about ourselves. And that autobiography is what we think about who we are. Who are we as a unique human being in the world? Well, in Alzheimer's disease, it's the cortex which is lost. These in individuals can't remember things from one point to another. Um, they start to lose the thread of their lives. They lose the thread of knowing who the people in their lives are. And this is a dreaded, terrible disease. Personally, I can't imagine anything worse than not being able to remember the events of your life and the people you have loved. I can't imagine anything worse than this. And so um, we want to do everything we can to help ourselves prevent this. So what is neuron lo why does neuron loss matter? Why does it matter that you lose something in the cortex? Well, it matters because uh, Dr. Petrie made a comment about this. Neurons don't replenish themselves. With rare exception, the neurons in your brain are the ones you had when you were born. Okay, in fact, you have fewer, a lot fewer now than you did when you were born. Not just because of aging, but because of other processes that naturally take place. So, Alzheimer's disease. This is a normal aging brain. And this is what the cortex looks like in Alzheimer's disease. There are reasons why we should be afraid of this disease. At autopsy, if you were to take a slice through an Alzheimer's brain and look at it with a microscope, you would see that there are proteins that are normally found in the brain that somehow get altered and cause problems. And you see these mentioned in the news. So within neurons, so this is a neuron, this is a neuron filled with a protein called tau. It's a precipitated protein that's normally found in the brain that now precipitates out and is associated with ter this terrible disease. There are many tauopathies, as we call them, Alzheimer's being one. And this big old thing sitting out here is called beta amyloid. And you hear that in the news, accumulation of this in the brain. And this, again, is a normal, normal protein that somehow gets deposited in the brain. We don't really know whether it, the disease itself causes these things to happen or whether these happenings, in fact, cause uh, the brain to diminish and for neurons to die. So the bottom line is, we don't know what causes 90 or 95 percent of Alzheimer's disease, okay? We don't know what that is. But what we have discovered are things that decrease or increase risk for getting the disease. So a risk factor doesn't cause something. It changes probability, okay? Does that make sense? All right. Factors that increase risk for idiopathic, idiopathic meaning cause unknown. The factors that increase risk, look at this, think about this. Age, well of course, aging, right? Sex, females get Alzheimer's at a much higher rate than males do. African Americans, greater than Caucasians. Inheritance of two E4 alleles for APOE. APOE is just a molecule in the brain that transports cholesterol. And cholesterol is normally used in the body to make membranes and to do other things. And an allele is just a variant that you um, inherit from your parents. You get one from mom, you get one from dad. If you get two E4 alleles for this particular protein, it increases your risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. It's the only known genetic risk factor that we have a lot of data for. Head injury increases risk. Multiple head injuries increase it even more. Obesity, 
high fat diet, elevated cholesterol, atherosclerosis, diabetes, hypertension, all of these things increase risk for getting this disease. History of untreated depression and chronic stress. Being depressed causes a lot of stress for people, okay? Love does make the world go around, okay? Being depressed and withdrawing from the world um, creates a lot of stress. Stress by itself kills neurons in the hippocampus. It also increases risk for Alzheimer's disease. And diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, which generally, at least when I came up and was learning these things, means memory problems in the absence of other cognitive issues. But it is a risk factor for developing Alzheimer's. All of these things increase risk. So, what decreases risk? This is what you really care about, right? And this is sort of, um, except for basically one thing, is a reiteration of what uh, Bill Petrie told you about how to be healthy in general in your body and your mind. And good genes, inheritance of E2 alleles for apolipoprotein E. Now this is it, so there's a number of variants for this. And if you inherit two E2 alleles, it greatly decreases your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And if you want to know what alleles you inherited, then by all means do 23andMe and they'll tell you, okay? Healthy diet, restful sleep, we're going to come back to that. Continuing mental challenge, strong social connections and exercise. Does this all sound like Dr. Petrie? It does, doesn't it? When two people reiterate the same thing in different contexts, that means we should listen, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So let's talk about how this improves brain function. How the last one on this I have in red for a reason. Exercise. This is my shtick, guys. You might eat healthy. You might do a lot of things. But whatever you're doing related to exercise, you need to do more of it, OK? So exercise includes aerobic activity where you have your heart rate up to a certain level. It means maintaining flexibility. It means all of the above. Not that you should do what I do, but I, I'll tell you what I do to give you an idea of where to take wherever you're at. You're starting at some place. I do. 10,000 to 12,000 steps a day, every single day. I do strength training twice a week here at a gym that specializes in helping people over 40 and 50 maintain health, okay? I do a full class of yoga once a week, but stretch and do yoga every single day. I am still under the recommended guidelines to maximum health in an older person. Okay? So I want you to think about that because we're all starting from someplace and I'm still in the process of trying to reach um, certain goals myself and to be as healthy as I possibly can be. And that's what we want for you as well. So what does exercise do? Well, there's only two areas that we know that new baby neurons get made in the adult brain, and that's the hippocampus and this area. So the area involved in short-term memory and the areas up here that are involved in judgment and uh, qualities like that. But it's important not to just generate new neurons. By the way, those new neurons aren't going to bring back lost memories. If you lose neurons in the hippocampus, because of your lifestyle or because you get a terrible disease. You're not going to get them back because you generate new baby neurons. Those baby neurons will be involved in new circuits and new memories, but they won't replace the old memories which are lost. If we want to retain the narrative of our life, the episodes in our lives, the people in our lives who have mattered, we need to keep the neurons we've got in those circuits, okay? Now, once these baby neurons are born, they have to be kept alive. And so, it, 
exercise increases the factors and blood supply that bring nutrients to these baby neurons and helps maintain them, okay? Synaptic plasticity, that's the ability to form new synapses. So when you go to these college classes, when you take music lessons, when you do all sorts of things, that new synapses can be made and reinforced that allow you um, to continue to learn and remember um, well into those 90s. Restful sleep, I really want to emphasize this. Exercise helps with restful sleep. And why does restful sleep matter? Wow, this is important. We have learned in neuroscience that restful sleep helps with memory consolidation. So if you want your memory to be better, sleep well. And another thing, which is big news now, restful sleep increases amyloid clearance from the brain. So that beta amyloid, which is a normal protein that in Alzheimer's precipitates in the brain and forms abnormal structures, during sleep, normal people remove this from the brain. And so restful sleep is important for clearing the brain of things that can potentially be very damaging to neurons. So restful sleep, and you exercise, it helps you sleep at night. There's no doubt about it. Also helps with the production of neurotransmitters <coughs> that play a role in attention, arousal, mood, and well-being. Okay? Exercise decreases age-related loss of neurons in the cortex and age-related decline in cognitive performance. This is in normal people, normal things that go on. Exercise decreases these losses and also decreases risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now, so let's look at this a different way. I think this is a better way to look at it. Factors that decrease risk, not under your control, choosing good parents. <laughs> I used to tell my medical students, if you want to live a long life, be beautiful and healthy and cognitively great and everything, then choose your parents well, okay? <laughs> Too late, already done, and not aging, okay? Now, what is under your control? Under your control, factors to decrease this risk for this terrible disease. What's under your control? Eating a healthy diet. And I always say, stay close to the earth and sea. And that reinforces what Bill Petrie said, stay close to the earth and sea, okay? Maintain a healthy weight, get restful sleep, continuing mental challenge want to put in a word here because this is important. This means challenging yourself. And it's just like muscle. Muscle gets stronger with challenge. Bone gets stronger with challenge. And the brain stays healthy and gets stronger with challenge. Challenge yourself. Take up something new and enjoy it. Maintain strong social and personal connections. And guys, if I say anything, you walk away from here today, whatever you're doing for physical exercise, increase it. Increase it safely and by steps, but increase what you're doing. Our sedentary lifestyle is killing us, okay? So um, not only is TV bad because the shows are dreadful, but because it makes us even more sedentary, and I think that's a big reason too, okay? This is your reunion. I hope that Dr. Petrie and I have both reinforced to you some things that are important. I want you to have a great reunion, enjoy seeing your old friends, and put on some rock and roll and dance, guys, all right? <laughs> Thank you.
put this back on you. Just because it's easier. You can ask him to repeat the question. Hey, John. How do you define restful sleep for us? Well, yeah, mostly it, uh, sleep comes in. Older people, by the way, this is not news to you guys. The, you spend more time in bed awake. So sleep becomes more and more vulnerable the older you get. We, we think the restful, you're talking about deep, uh, yeah, the delta, whatever, the deep, uh, deep sleep that, that occurs shortly after you go to bed. You start having dreams, that's REM sleep, that's later in the night, and that's not, a, that's not what Jeanette's talking about. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. So how many of you have had a good night's sleep? When you wake up in the morning refreshed, you feel terrific and ready to face day. That's good restful sleep, okay? <laughs> Waking up in the morning and feeling dreadful and feeling like you didn't get any sleep and not feeling energized to take advantage of the gift of this day, that's not restful sleep. So I always hug my little dog, and that helps me get restful sleep. Get a dog. See if he said get a dog. What else? What else? You mentioned exercise, too, but that helps you sleep. What mm -hmm. else? I think being a happy person. I think being a person who's connected to others and doing things for other people. Yeah, let me say sleep hygiene, which is pretty much go to bed the same time each night and wake up the same time each morning and try to get that programmed so that you get that. For most people, it's, it's uh, seven to nine hours, but there's great variation. There's some people who are short sleepers and some who are long sleepers. Uh, sleeping pills are usually not a great idea. And if you have to use something, just start with herbal remedies, herbal teas, melatonin. Usually it's combined with other stuff in the drugstore. And that's not bad. And it's pretty good for you. Um, so, Exercise. Yeah, and fitness. It really, it helps you sleep better. Um, my name is Barbara Nixon. Um, I have a question. I have an understanding. I've done some reading about um, a lot of developments around Alzheimer's in the last couple of years. And, uh, neuroscientists who have actually had some success reversing Alzheimer's and I know that in Boston where I live I have a friend whose husband is in a trial at Massachusetts General Hospital working uh, on some of this and I wonder if you could come in. Well I believe that our failure to find a specific disease modifying therapy has been one of the great failures in medicine in the last 50 years that basically we don't have anything at this point. There's a guy named Bredesen who t had wrote, written a book, but he's not really uh, accepted by most researchers in the area. There are some encouraging things, but we, it is nothing has worked. All the stuff that was aimed at amyloid didn't work. The tau stuff they're looking at. So right now, I think you're better off doing what Jeanette says. That, that it's not that, it's, it's, it's discouraging for the people who are doing it. And okay. work in here. I, I'd like to, this, this, this is really important. If you lose these neurons, if they die, there is no replacing them. You do not reverse Alzheimer's disease. Correct. You may, um, with, we have the hopes as, as scientists, we have the hope that we will be able to diagnose it earlier and develop pharmaceuticals or something that might delay um, delay the progression of yeah. the disease. We are not going to reverse it. And Jeanette's amyloid and tau, that forms 25 years before you ever have symptoms. Mm -hmm. The process begins early. So when we say lifelong learning and lifelong fitness, you need to do it all you can. You can't start too soon. Oh, good afternoon. I'm Ken Parrott. Both of you disparage sitting and watching TV, which I can understand. How does that differ from sitting and watching a lecture, or sitting and playing bridge, or sitting and reading a book? Well, I would say the bridge is the best because it involves social interaction. Um, we, we're trying to figure out about electronic media, what that does, uh, but 
look on your, uh, go on the internet and look at television and mortality. We can't exa explain exactly why it happens, but let me tell you, it's there. And I would make a comment too, that today's television, in addition to the bad programming, it's upsetting. It's all politicized. You watch any channel and it's people yelling at you. And then uh, commercials, what do you have, what do you have to say well, about that? Well, I mean, I certainly agree with that. I, I think part of it is just being sedentary. And I think if people can sit and watch TV four or five hours, there aren't a lot of other things people do that they just sit for four or five hours straight without getting up and moving around. I'm concerned about younger people because, like Bill said, we believe that Alzheimer's, and there was a wonderful study, if we had time, the Nun study, um, that um, we believe the changes take place far earlier and may even start by the late 20s. And so this is very serious when you think about young people today who can sit for four or five hours, six hours or longer um, staring at a screen which, or watching movies or whatever, just sitting that entire time. This is going to kill our children and grandchildren. This is, this is bad for their brains. I mean, this is just really bad for their brains. And um, that sedentary lifestyle, I think, is beyond the programming and the yelling. If, if I get too much political news, I'm a very good sleeper and have very good sleep hygiene. I lie awake at night wondering if the world is going to hell <laughs> in a handbasket, okay? And so I find it very difficult to like listen to the news before I go to bed. So if you find that there are things that upset you, then don't do them then. You know, you can look at the news the next day <laughs> or something. Also, get rid of the blue lights and the green lights in your bedroom and try to, to reserve the bedroom for sleep and sex. <laughs> so that is to not do a lot of other stuff in the bedroom. So when you go to the bedroom, you're, you're, you're trying to relax. Over here. So my name is Paul Pankers. Uh, you were mentioning earlier how important the walking was. And I was wondering how, what correlation there is between walking and the swimming pool through water. Uh, if that's going to give the same effect I think it's. I think it's very good. My own, my own study was that. My, my, I had a daughter who was uh, two daughters who were really active swimmers, and I would see some of these kids that that swam distance six or seven miles a day, and swam with my daughter, and they had subcutaneous fat. They weren't like anything like distance runners. So swimming itself, because it's not, <laughs> because it's not weight bearing has some problems because the water is cooler than your body and your body says let's put more I mean look at look at dolphins and whales they're blubbery so so I don't but but I think walking is a is a good thing and and for arthritic problems it, it's valuable well and adding to that swimming is excellent cardiovascular exercise yes no doubt about it but walking puts stress on the bone and again, stress on the bone is positive for bone health, keeping you from falling, and also those big quads, those quads, okay, that healthy for the muscles and the bones that are going to help you keep from falling, and falling is a major cause of death in older people. And so swimming doesn't do these things for you. So um, now, I, walk, I do the 10 to 12,000 steps a day, which is five or six miles a day. Five or six walking, five or six miles. Jim Morgan, uh, I uh, think you may have covered this with your television answer, but I look at today's generation, sometimes us too, and it's not just television with all the streaming and all the new choices we got, but it's these little handhelds you know, with every social media and texting and email. So are you including, is that including in that four hours? Is that included in that four hours? No, no, that's, that's television. I'm talking about people who watch. So what is, what is your thoughts on, on what? Well, I, I, I think that's, it's a, it's a major problem. I, I, I think it interferes with a lot of the natural interpersonal interaction. I mean, you know, I had in my office one day, two of my partners were having a big a fight about how much money they were making. And they start emailing each other. And I said, hey, 
get up, go in the room next door and talk to them and figure out what's going on. You, when I talk to my kids or grandkids, they text. And you know texting, it's, it's like six words. And then you got to respond. And, and I, to me, I think there's some problems with that. What do you... <laughs> oh, absolutely. In your cemetery when you're doing it. Yeah. And the, the personal connection. We look at people's faces. We look at people's faces to get feedback. You sit and text everything, you know, information or whatever. This, this is not the same thing as interacting with a person. This is not the same thing as having that connection, that bond, that attachment uh, to people. So I encourage people to talk to each other um, as much as possible. I rarely turn myself on. I use it for emergencies. Bill? Uh, yes, Bill. I'm Bill Davis. And I have a question about one of your slides that seemed to indicate that coffee was good. Yes. Uh, I'd like for you to expand on that a little bit. Well, there have been a bunch of studies lately that talked about caffeine's positive effect on cognition. Uh, that it, that, and it actually helped patients who had some mild cognitive impairments. Uh, and I think the, other, the reason that I think it's helpful is that it puts you into a, heightened, a slightly heightened level of activity. And uh, for some people, I tell them to dose the coffee. You know, it, it, it comes out, and, and that is to get busy with it, to read, to walk, to do the things you want to do. When you're in that 85 to 90 age, you, sometimes you need a little help. Grilled red meat was much worse for you than ungrilled. Are grilled veggie burgers worse than not? <laughs> I think it's the carbon, uh, the the burn, the black, the black and yeah. So I think that is uh, that's the issue. The but but I think veggie burgers are good. I think in the next ten years we'll see a lot more advances in sort of non-animal proteins. Uh, you, you, we got. We want to enjoy some, but for the most part, we want to reduce animal proteins. And guys, the Beyond Thank Burgers, they really do taste like hamburgers. They're really good. By the way, the average American eats 300 more calories a day than they did in 1970. Wow. 300 more calories a day. I wanted to follow up a little bit on the handheld devices. I'm certainly not promoting extensive use of them, but you were talking about getting out of your comfort zone, uh, relating to people who are different from you and whatever. And um, I work at my church, and um, a number of the folks in our congregation are older and are afraid of technology. And what I see happening is they tend to disconnect. And I'm suggesting that maybe there's a balance there somewhere because I think learning, if they learn to use the technology, that engages the brain. And, and the, the younger generation is using this stuff. So if you don't know how to use it and you don't use it, then you are just kind of I think that's an excellent point that you got to use both. Yes, and they're, they're not then going to become addicted to it and stay on for five hours at a time. But yes, as a challenge to older people, and everyone should learn how to use technology anyway because that's the modern world. And so we all live in it, so we should. Dr. Petrie, I believe you said that walking speed was a particular longevity. Yeah. What is that speed? <laughs> 1.1 1 .1 meters per second is the, the, the one you want to make. Uh, and the Okay, well, well, you, you want to walk as briskly as you can, basically. You want to push, push the walking. I mean, Jeanette, you, if you're walking five, five miles a day, you want to you wanna hurry it up. But, but um, yeah, I think that's generally, uh, we, we measure walking speed in a lot of very old people. That's when it's going to really count when you're 85 and 90. You know, that's when you really want to be a good walker. You want to be the fall. <laughs> Yes. That's good. 
And that's good to help. One, one quick question on supplements. Yeah. A lot of advertising, um, prevention, which is no. Don't do it. Don't do it. Hey, thank you. No, don't. We did not agree. We agree. Yeah, no. Don't do it. Prevagen. Don't do this thing. No, it doesn't hurt you, but they. Uh, Prevagen. Prevagen are advertised on television a lot. Uh, the, the jellyfish helps your memory, defeat Alzheimer's disease. They're about to, they were incited by the FDA for false advertising. And, and it's. Yeah. You're really better off eating food than eating supplements. So go home and buy some spinach and kale greens and eat them. Yeah, it's, it's a lot better for you. And exercise. Yes. Does tea have the same positive effect? Yeah, a tea does. Coffee is a more complex compound. Coffee has a lot of stuff in it. Tea is, is more, you know, but tea is also very helpful. Green tea particularly has been described in a lot of studies, so it's mostly the caffeine that I'm talking about to, to get people awakened. I, my first thing is say, when I tell people, say, try Starbucks. Have a Starbucks at noon and see how you feel at 1 or 2 o'clock. Uh, uh, Jeannie Nelson. I will, uh, you're going to have to just pick out a way to answer this one, but um, <coughs> what I, I just always come back to in a lot of these diseases, let's take Alzheimer's, when are the mechanisms and machines going to get cheap enough to take a picture early enough where you get panic to really do something about it? That's what we're working on. People are working on amyloid scans, Jeanette's amyloid to try it. But the problem is, at that point, you cast a huge net. And we don't know how to sort, sort them out at age 40. Uh, you visit your, your doctor, and he says, your cholesterol is too high. And you feel fine. You have no symptoms. And he says, you need to take a statin, and then you will reduce your incidence of heart disease. Now, we need that for this, but we're not there yet, and we're trying. What do you think? I, I do want to make a comment about that, though. Um, we do need to identify these disorders earlier. But one test which is so rarely used, and I used to encourage my medical students, no matter what kind of doctor you become, make sure you do this every time you meet with a, with a patient. Ask them if they've noticed any change in smell, whether they can smell normally anymore. My own sister has Parkinson's disease, and um, I didn't realize this until after she'd been diagnosed. She hadn't been able to smell since the 1980s. And now we know for all the neurodegenerative diseases, all three of them, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, people have diminished ability to smell. And this is something, if you notice this, tell your doctor. And maybe, maybe something that simple could be used to identify people. But let's all remember something else. Rather than wait until we're diagnosed and hope that medicine will save us, let's do whatever we can do right now to decrease the risk for getting a disease. I, I really feel strongly about that. Don't count on somebody figuring out how to replace those neurons that are lost, because it's not going to happen. Yes, I'm Jim Alexander, and for much of my life I've been a distance runner. One of the things I have struggled with, though, is, uh, and, and we're getting into this, and I'm having trouble with it now as I've gotten older, is um, uh, issues related to overuse injuries and determining, and I know I'm more prone to this as I've gotten older, and I struggle with uh, how I trouble taking days of rest, but I know I need to. Do you all have any suggestions related to that, especially as you age? Yeah, I think you've got to be creative and come up with uh, new ways of using your muscles that, that don't wear them down. A lot of the machines uh, that you, uh, the, the exercise machines are pretty good with that. They can minimize that, but it is a challenge with, with orthopedic uh, damage, how can you get it, how do you get your heart rate up doing some other things? You might try swimming, you might try some other things. Also, running is, is a really good example. When you run, you're putting a lot of stress, see, pounding. 
and so the knees, you know, take the, a big hit and everything. You might try um, brisk walking, you know, like power walking. You might enjoy that, or swimming, or some other kind of, of exercise that doesn't pound on the joints so much. Um, and I think, uh, as far as days of rest, um, be kind to your body. Because rest is just as important for muscle and bone and cognitive health as anything else. So be kind. And that's one of them. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to say, Katie's going to make us leave here in a minute. But um, we got one more question queued up over here. And I'm willing to bet that these two people would stick around and answer your questions for a little while, even if the session was over. Would you do that? Mm -hmm. Or do you have time? Or do you want yeah. them to? <laughs> I think that was a yes to all of them. Yeah. Hi, my name is Shelly Britton, and I want to ask you a question about the restful sleep. You don't want us to take any medications, but were you, as a psychiatrist, writing prescriptions for separate bedrooms? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and get a sleep study. Get George to have a sleep study to see if he's, if he's having apneic episodes, and yeah, I, you gotta go into different bedrooms. When you have a bad snore, forget it. You can't, you just can't sleep. So, uh, <laughs> sorry George, but. Uh, I this person up and they jump yes. Right so, okay, I'm Janice and I had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Norton once before, and in terms of diet, I remember that you told us that you ended your day with a glass of red wine, into which she had poured some sour cherry juice, I believe it was. Would you tell cherry us more juice. about that? <laughs> well, yes, the, the alcohol in moderation and if antioxidant properties of tart cherry juice. So one day I just decided to do a half a glass of the wine and half a glass of tart cherry juice, and I thought it was quite delicious. And, you know, just sort of a routine and a sort of hmm, kind of thing that seemed to help me, and I enjoyed that for many years. I haven't done it lately, but it's something I really enjoy. You have to be careful with this alcohol thing because alcohol can also interfere with restful sleep. So it's one of the reasons I was having very little and then the cherry juice on top of it. And, or cherry juice and sangria, which is also quite delicious. <laughs> and uh, Bill and I are members of a dinner group that get together. And because I drive when I go to those I don't drink at all. But um, yes, just, you know, everything in moderation. Everything, except exercise. <laughs> <laughs> great way to stop. Thank you guys. Okay. That was great.